afternoon. So I've uh, done this a few times and I appreciate you being here. Uh, one of the problems with doing a Zoom presentation is I can't see you. And I was told that for privacy reasons, they don't have your video on. So I can't see if there's any crowd reaction or whether it's going well or poorly. Um, so, you know, if the question and answer could be for questions, which of course I'm very much looking forward to questions. And uh, number two, if it's too loud, it's too soft, you know, you can't see me, whatever, please, uh, please put something in. So I was asked to talk about the basics of cardiology and then also how one can prevent oneself from having those kinds of problems. So I'm gonna start off uh, with just some basic stuff so you understand how a cardiologist thinks of cardiology. Then we'll talk about risk factor uh, modification. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna put in a little plug for everybody to make sure that they've spoken about their end of life issues and pulse and DNR. Then I'm gonna show a couple of pictures of the high tech things that are going on at Valley Hospital uh, to uh, help people. And then I really wanna go through it quickly because my experience in these, in these uh, forums is that people have questions. And what happens is the first question takes a few minutes to go, but then once questions start, people start going, hey, you know, my mom has AFib or my sister had a stent or what is a TAVR and those kinds of things. And of course, I'm happy to answer all those questions. So we're gonna go right to the basics. So I wanted just people to take a look at a heart. Uh, so the heart has four chambers, two on the top and then two on the bottom. And um, it also has four valves, one, two, three, four. They all have everything in medicine has a funny name, the tricuspid valve, the mitral valve, the aortic valve, the pulmonary valve. And just to let you understand how the blood circulates. So this is the vein that comes down from your brain. It goes into the right atrium through the tricuspid valve. This is the right ventricle. It pumps the blood into the pulmonary arteries. The pulmonary arteries take the blood to the lungs. Doesn't show you how the blood comes back from the lungs, but it ends up in the left atrium through the mitral valve. The bottom left chamber pumps, goes through this aortic valve. Oops, sorry about that. Goes through the aortic valve. And this is the aorta. It's the main pipe. This is the artery that goes to your right arm and your right carotid. This is the artery that goes to your left carotid. And this is the artery that goes to your left arm. And the reason I put up this picture is every one of these things that I just pointed out to you could have its own illness. So the way we tend to think of the heart is there are all these pieces and each one can have its own specific problem. So for a valve, valves can have basically three kinds of problems, either they don't open well. So instead of going like this, they go like this. Or they don't close well. So instead of closing all the way, they don't quite close all the way. Or they can get an infection on them, something that doctors call endocarditis. Endo is inside, card is heart, itis is infection. Okay. So each of the valves has its own little uh, potential for problems. And then the heart muscle itself can have problems. One problem the heart muscle can have is it doesn't squeeze good. Another problem the heart muscle can have is it doesn't relax good. Another problem the heart muscle can have is sometimes it's too thick. There also could be infections and inflammation and viruses that affect the heart muscle. So the idea of this slide is just a, a general view of what a heart looks like and what the pieces look like. And number two, to get us thinking about the problems that go to the heart have to do with each specific part of the heart. So this is a little uh, a cartoon of the aortic valve. The aortic valve has three, what are called leaflets. And when they open, there's a hole. So going into the screen here, that's the, um, the bottom left chamber, the ventricle coming out of the screen here is the aorta, that main pipe, because now we took the picture and went from going like this, and now we're looking at it like this. And the point of this picture is that sometimes as you get older, the valve stops opening well. So instead of it opening like this, it opens like this. If you think about the valve itself, it's been opening and closing 60 to 80 to 100 times a minute since before you were born. So if you add, do the math, it's been opening up and closing up millions of times and it wears out. And when it wears out, it gets little calcifications. And when the valve doesn't open up well, you get an illness called aortic 
stenosis. Stenosis is the doc word for the valves not opening well. So instead of the valve going like this, it's only going like this. Instead of the hole being big, the hole is small. And now the heart has to struggle to push the blood through the small hole. Nowadays, it used to be we have to send people to the operating room to have their chest open and the surgeon would take out the old valve and put in the new valve. Nowadays, we can do this procedure called a TAVR, T-A-V-R. We do a lot of it valley now. It stands for transaortic valve replacement. And the idea of it is we go in through your leg, we put a balloon into the tight valve, blow up the balloon. Now it opens up the valve. We take the balloon out and then believe it or not, through your leg, oops, you can't say it, through your leg, we thread a new valve. The new valve goes inside the old valve. We open up the new valve, take our hardware out and you have a new valve inside the old valve. So the heart doesn't just have plumbing, the heart also has electrical wiring. So this is a picture of the electrical wiring of the heart, sort of a cartoon. And uh, many of you might've heard the expression, left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block. So the idea here again, two chambers in the heart, left upper chamber, right upper chamber, right lower chamber, left lower chamber. The normal pacemaker of the heart is in the right upper chamber. Everything in, in medicine has a, has a doc name. It's called the sinoatrial node. And the heart has electrical wiring that takes the beat from the upper chamber down to the lower chambers. And even though they're made of flesh, they're electrical wires nevertheless. And because of how they looked under a microscope more than a hundred years ago, they were called bundle branches because they're made of, of, they look like bundles of tissue under the microscope. And what can happen is as you get older, the electrical system can slow down. And if the electricity is no longer traveling down the left bundle, we call that left bundle branch block. It turns out it's a bad name. It's not really a blockage at all. It's an old fashioned name. It's more like left bundle has slowed down. And the idea of it is that if, you, if your left bundle isn't really working well, now you're living on your right bundle. And if your right bundle stops working, then the electrical impulse isn't going from the upper to the lower chamber and you would need a pacemaker to treat that. So again, structures in the heart, under ordinary circumstance, they work fine. And then something goes wrong and problems happen. In this case, if you had a bundle branch block, you would potentially pass out not bundle branch out. If you had complete blockage of these things, you might pass out and you might need a pacemaker. Then I wanted to show you the coronary arteries. Now we're back to plumbing again. So the arteries that feed blood to the heart muscle are on the outside of the heart, not the inside of the heart. So the blood comes out of the heart into the aorta through that aortic valve, like what we talked about, and then it just turns right around and goes down the coronary arteries. And these are all branches. And then little branches go into the heart muscle and um, feed the heart muscle with blood. This happens to be a, a cartoon of what atherosclerosis looked like. One of the illnesses that one can have of the uh, uh, blood vessels. There are other uh, illnesses that you can have, although they're much rare compared to coronary artery disease. And this is the kind of thing that you might get a stent, sort of a little bit similar to the valve replacement uh, that I described in the other slide. You would go up through someone's leg, put a balloon into this blockage, blow up the balloon, crush the stuff to the side, put a piece of metal in there that we call a stent. I didn't put a picture in of that, or maybe I did, but I don't think I did. And, um, that would hold the artery open and restore blood flow down the artery. So again, structures in the heart, everything can go wrong, okay? And then each one of those illnesses has its own little name. Okay, quick, that was a quick introduction to uh, heart anatomy, let us thinking. Now I wanna jump into risk factors. So. Risk factors are a statistical thing. So I could tell you that I have obese, diabetic, 
smokers who've never had a heart attack. And I've had thin vegetarian marathon runners who have had a heart attack. So everything in my business is an on average kind of thing. So if you are a smoker, your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke or lung cancer or emphysema or bladder cancer or like you know a million different bad things is higher compared to someone who doesn't do it. It doesn't mean that because you smoke, you're gonna get heart, uh, heart disease. It just increases your risk. And just because you don't smoke doesn't mean you won't get heart disease, but it lowers your risk. So these are the established risk factors for heart disease. So I'm just going to go through them one by one. You know, smoking is an obvious one. If you smoke, you need to quit. You know, I, I tell my patients that smoking is all, but all bad things rolled into one. Like I said, heart attack, stroke, cancer of your mouth, cancer of your esophagus, cancer of your bladder, cancer of your lungs, emphysema, you know, just a terrible thing. Um, and the only thing to do is to quit. Quitting is very difficult. There are two aspects of quitting. There's the nicotine addiction, which really only lasts for a couple of weeks, you know, where you really hate people and want to hit something. But the habituation, which is, okay, I want to have a cup of coffee and then I want a cigarette, turns out that that never goes away. So once you get over the nicotine addiction, you're still going to want to have a cigarette after your coffee and you have to substitute something else in. There are some medicines. Frankly, they don't help that much. There are nicotine patches and nicotine gum and like Wellbutrin, which is sort of a antidepressant type of medicine that has been shown to be beneficial. There are other treatments. Valley actually has a, a, a smoking cessation a class of some kind or a, a program of some kind. Um, but if you, quit, if you have cigarette smoke, you need to quit. Diabetes, another very potent risk factor for having premature heart disease. For diabetes, you need a blood test. It has a funny doc name. It's called the hemoglobin A1C. You know, it doesn't matter for the, our conversation. The point is that you need a blood test. Uh, and if you have diabetes, many people who have diabetes are overweight and their diabetes gets better if they lose weight. But other people, even if they're thin, they have um, diabetes and it needs to be treated to get that hemoglobin A1C as low as you could possibly get it to the normal range. High blood pressure. So for high blood pressure, risk of stroke, risk of heart failure, uh, risk of heart attack, got to have your blood pressure checked. And you really should have it checked probably once a year, you know, particularly if you're, uh, as you're getting older, uh, it's, it's definitely worthwhile. Some of my patients, you know, check their blood pressure three times a day. It's overkill, you know, once a year is really fine. If you have high blood pressure and you want to keep an eye on it, once a week is fine or twice a week. You know, this uh, sort of checking your blood pressure three and four times a day just makes your blood pressure go up. Not that helpful. Unfortunately, if you have blood pressure, you're going to need to take medications. The non-medicinal approach to blood pressure is not tremendously successful, but it would be restricting the salt in your diet, increasing your aerobic exercise, and uh, losing weight. I tell people all the time, almost no 20 year olds have high blood pressure. 85% of 80 year olds have high blood pressure. So between here and now, here and then, you get high blood pressure, okay? It's very common, you have to keep an eye on it. The current recommendation is, um, a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90. However, it turns out that with blood pressure, just like with diabetes, lower is better. So a blood pressure of 140 is better than 150, but really 130 is better than that, 120 is better than that, and really 110 is better than that. So people ask me, is there a blood pressure that's too low? Oops, sorry about that. Is there a blood pressure that's too low? And the answer to that is no. Uh, low is fine unless you have symptoms, symptoms being like lightheadedness when you stand up or I feel like I'm going to pass out or you're on so many medications that you have medication side effects. The average person in America who has high blood pressure is on three medicines. So it's not unusual at all to be on two or three medicines to control high blood pressure. In fact, 
it's been shown that being on three medicines at medium doses causes less side effects than two medicines at high doses. So often you're better off being on an extra medicine at a medium dose compared to being on two medicines at a, at a high dose. So again, high blood pressure, you need to get it checked. You probably need to take medicines. Salt restriction, weight loss, and exercise. Elevated cholesterol uh, needs a blood test. Everybody should have a screening blood test to see what their cholesterol is. Just like with high blood pressure, just with high uh, diabetes, lower is better. So a cholesterol of 200 is good. 180 is better than that. 160 is better than that. And 120 is better than that. There are, uh, again, the same kind of weight loss exercise things. Turns out that changing your diet is not as helpful as people think. So if you go from an average American diet, which is not a great diet, and become a vegetarian. So go to a flat out um, zero cholesterol diet. Your cholesterol only goes down about 15 points, 15%, pardon me. So that means if you started it at 230, now you're down to 200. So you don't get a lot of bang uh, from uh, changing your diet, although of course it's worthwhile. And what you eat is important too, in the sense that fish is better than chicken and chicken is better than beef. Uh, often you need medicines. There are only really two recommended cholesterol medicines at this point, Crestor and Lipitor, which is rosuvastatin and atorvastatin. There are two, only two recommended doses of each one of those medicines. So if you're on Crestor, which is rosuvastatin, if you're looking for what's called primary prevention, that is a 20 milligram dose. And if you've actually had a heart attack or stroke or bypass surgery or anything like that, then you should be on 40 milligrams. The side effect from statin medications, about 5% of people get muscle aches. It's really overblown in, in the public sphere that somehow you know statins are really terrible. There is a teeny weeny uh, increase in diabetes for people who are on statins. Some people say there might be an even teenier uh, increase in dementia. But on the other hand, there's a 30 to 40% reduction of having a heart attack or a stroke. So the benefits of those medicines clearly outweigh the risks. Many people are underdosed. I tell people all the time, if you're gonna take a medicine every day, you might as well take enough of it that you get the maximum benefit when the downside risk is a small percent chance that you get muscle aches. And frankly, if you get the muscle aches, we either stop the medicine, reduce the dose, or try a different pill. Obesity, hard to lose weight. So there's an, uh, the uh, expression is called the body mass index or BMI. BMI is a measure that has your weight, but it's in kilograms, not in, in pounds, divided by the square of your height in meters. So it really has to do with your weight compared to your height. And a normal BMI is 25. My personal BMI is 27, right? Hard to be a, you're sort of a thin person from our perspective if you have a BMI of 25. But the reason that that 25 number was picked is that if you look at a graph of weight versus bad things, everything's pretty good until you get to a BMI of 25. And then by the time you get to 30, the risks of bad things happening go up. So 30 is considered obese. 40 is considered morbidly obese, very hard to lose weight. I personally, depending on who you are, I'm actually a fan of weight loss surgery, bariatric surgery. Weight loss surgery is the only treatment for obesity that has been shown to make people live longer, but you have to be pretty obese. You know, BMI of 35 with diabetes or sleep apnea or BMI of 40. You, know, you have to be a pretty heavy person to warrant the risks of weight loss surgery. Other than that, Unfortunately, you have to go hungry. Hunger is your only way to lose weight. So dieting is all about managing your hunger. There's, I mean, that's a whole talk in and of itself about how to lose weight. Uh, but if you're overweight, you're putting yourself at increased risk for heart problems, you should lose weight. Sedentary behavior, being a couch potato is a risk factor for heart disease. But I tell people all the time, you do not have to be gasping for air or pouring sweat to be exercising. You just have to be walking, not strolling, brisk walk. And the current recommendation for exercise is a 20 to 30 minute walk five days out of seven. 
So it really means going around the block twice after dinner. It's not a big lift. Exercise is not a weight loss strategy. I hear that all the time. When I get back to the gym, I'll lose weight, but that's not true. If the average size person goes and runs for a mile, they only burn like 140 calories, 140 calories, like ha- less than half a bagel. So it, uh, exercise is not a weight loss strategy, but it's good in and of itself. It makes you feel better. Actually, people who exercise live longer, you know, a worthwhile thing. And then of course, family history of heart disease. Family history of heart disease though means premature heart disease, premature heart disease. That means if your mother or father had a heart attack if your father had a heart attack in his 50s or your mother had a heart attack in her 60s, if your dad had a heart attack in his 80s, that really doesn't give you any additional risk. You know, pretty much uh, I like to say everybody dies and most people who die, die of a heart attack. So eventually 25% of us are going to die from heart attacks. So those are the uh, risk factors, the modifiable risk factors, except for the family history uh, that can reduce your chances of having a heart problem down the road. You know, again, this is one of my uh, pet things that I'm uh, that I think is really underdone. Uh, you need to talk about what your goals are uh, when things turn bad, and of course, the older you are, the more important it becomes. But it doesn't really matter because if you're a, uh, you know, God forbid, a uh, young person, a young woman, a fifty-year-old woman, and you have breast cancer that spread to your brain. You need to have end of life discussions too. So it doesn't really have to do with how old you are. It has to do with what your illnesses are and what your quality of life is. And in my world, people who are perfectly healthy collapse, have heart attacks, have brain damage because they had lack of oxygen and now they're on a respirator in the ICU and they're not waking up and nobody knows what to do because they haven't previously ex- expressed their wishes. So a uh, pulsed is a uh, physician order for life-sustaining treatment. It's a a formal New Jersey government approved document that outlines what you want. Durable power of attorney is actually appointing another individual, your spouse, your child, whoever, to make decisions for you when you can't make them. Do not resuscitate and do not intubate. The word intubate has to do with that plastic tube that goes in your throat when you're on a respirator. So some people, people are very different. I mostly take care of older folk and you have older people who say, do everything you can. I wanna live as long as I possibly can. And you have other older folk who say, I lived a very long life. I'm very happy with that, leave me alone. And as I point out here at the bottom, this is actually the most important sentence. I've looked at a lot of these documents. They're often not particularly helpful in the situation that you're in. So the more important thing is to have a conversation with your loved ones. So if the uh, shit, God forbid, hits the fan, that there's someone who knows what you want. All right. Okay, so I'm going to. Uh, share just a couple of slides on, let me take some time check. Yeah, good. Um, uh, of some of the high tech devices we have available at Valley. This one is called the mitral clip. The idea of it is I was showing you that sometimes the valve opens, but it doesn't really close all the way. In this case, it's like this actually, it doesn't quite close all the way. And so this is a device that can take one leaflet. That's what those things that go up and down we call leaflets can grab one leaflet in this little thing here and another uh, leaflet in this little thing here and cinch them closer together like this. So again, we're back to that heart model. This is the bottom pumping chamber. This is the aorta up here, the aortic valve. This is the mitral valve. We've come up through someone's leg, crossed over from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart. And we're about to deploy this mitral clip. This is the mitral valve. This is the anterior leaflet. This is the posterior leaflet. It's not closing. And here the operator has grabbed one leaflet of the valve uh, in one of these pincers and the other leaflet of the valve in the other pincer and then closed it. And now the valve is closed in the middle, but has enough, because it's a, th- it's a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional thing. So there's valve this way and there's valve coming toward out of the screen. So even though it's closed off completely in the middle, there's enough movement on the insides, um, sorry, on the outsides that you know, enough blood can get through. So it doesn't make 
leakies, leakiness go away completely, uh, but it, it prevents you from having to go to the operating room for a surgeon to go in there and fix the valve. In general, nowadays, this particular procedure is really for people who are not candidates for heart surgery. You know, perhaps you have severe emphysema or you have bad kidneys or whatever, you're frail. So this is a way to fix the valve without opening your chest. This is what it looks like when it's fully deployed. So to grab the lethal of the valves, hold them, to, hold them together. Okay, now I talked to you at the beginning about aortic stenosis where the valve's not opening all the way. And so the hole, instead of being big, is too small and the heart has to struggle to pump the blood through the small hole. So this is a way we can fix this without opening your chest. So the aorta's here. So the aorta goes up and around and down to your legs. So right now we're sticking a tube in your leg down here and bringing our balloon all the way up and around. And we put the balloon into the tight valve and blow up the balloon and it cracks open the valve. So now it's not stuck together and it opens. Then we take that balloon out. And again, through your leg, we put a new tube. And this has a valve that's scrunched up on another balloon. We blow up the second balloon. It expands the valve. The valve has little metal things that hook on to the sides as it goes around. And now you have Oops, sorry, not a picture of that. Now we have a new valve inside the old valve. All right, we take the balloon away and the new valve stays inside the old valve. And then uh, lastly, this is another thing we do a lot of. This is called the Watchman device. So without getting too complicated, there's an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation that is associated with stroke. And the idea of it is the heart's supposed to go lub dub, lub dub. And when you have fibrillation, the heart's not lubbing. And so the blood in the upper chamber, it's not getting pumped out vigorously with each beat and blood that's not pumped out vigorously can clot. And if a clot breaks off and flies north, you can get a stroke from that. So this is a magnification of the upper left chamber. And this is a structure, it's got a funny name. It's called the left atrial appendage. And this is where the blood clots form that cause stroke. Just like with the uh, mitral valve and the aortic valve, it used to be that if we wanted to tie off the left atrial appendage, the surgeon would have to open up your chest. Now there's a way to go in through your leg, again, cross over from the right side to the left side, and then put this device called the watchman, which looks a little bit like the aortic valve balloon, but of course it's a little different. But the idea is the same, that you put it in place, you unlatch it. This is a self-expanding device. You don't need the balloon to expand it and it covers up the left atrial appendage. And so the blood no longer flows into the left atrial appendage. This is made for people who need to be on the blood thinners like Coumadin or Xeralto or, or Eliquis. And they need to be on that to reduce their risk of stroke because they have atrial fibrillation, but they can't be on it because they fell and hit their head or they bled from their stomach or some other reason, some other complication that, um, prevents them from being on blood thinners and therefore their stroke of uh, the risk of stroke goes up. So a watchman device is a way to reduce your risk of stroke when you can't be on blood thinners. Okay, I kind of raced through this all because I wanted to have you know, enough opportunity for everybody to ask questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Barr. Actually, we do have some questions that have already come in. I'd like Please. to remind everyone, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A portal which is located at the bottom of your screen. Um, the first question, would mild chest pain on exertion mean a heart problem? Well, the short answer to that is yes. Not necessarily, of course, but chest pain on exertion should definitely be evaluated by a cardiologist. It is a cardinal sign that chest pain is something that docs call, can be what docs call angina. Um, usually people say that actually say they don't have pain. It's more of a tightness or a pressure or a squeezing or a heaviness, that kind of feeling. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not having pain. I'm having pressure, that kind of thing. Uh, particularly if it's like a reproducible thing, like every time you climb a, climb a flight of stairs, um, you get that feeling. The idea there is I showed you a picture of a blockage. So your heart 
It's a simple pump. It needs oxygen to work. When you're sitting there, it's not working that hard and it doesn't need that much oxygen. But once you start walking up a flight of stairs, your heart has to work harder to supply the blood so you're, you can get up those stairs. And when it works harder, it needs more blood, it needs more oxygen. And so the normal thing that happens is those coronary arteries that, that I showed you the picture of earlier, they dilate to supply more blood to the heart muscle. But if you have a blockage, the artery can't dilate. Now the heart wants oxygen that it can't get and that can give you this feeling that doctors call angina. So it can definitely be exertional chest pain is a classic angina kind of thing. Some people have angina at rest. Some people have more atypical symptoms. Sometimes they get uh, a discomfort in their jaw. Sometimes they feel like they get a discomfort in their left arm because your body's not that good at localizing pain on the inside. On the outside, you can tell the difference between touching you here and touching you here, but on the inside, the the body's not good at it. And that's why there's nothing wrong with your jaw when you have jaw pain, but it's the manifestation of angina. In fact, the word angina itself is Latin for choking because when it was named before anybody, you know, people called it angina before any, anybody knew anything about anything about the anatomy or the physiology. And uh, so the word angina is choking because people had a sensation in their neck. Next question. Okay, we have a couple different ones about um, cholesterol. One was when you were mentioning cholesterol medications, um, a question came in, what about simvastatin? Simvastatin um, is really no longer used except for people who've been on it chronically for years and have tolerated it. So I renew simvastatin for people who've been on simvastatin for a long time and have no problem but I never write a new prescription for simvastatin anymore. The reason simvastatin was so popular is because years ago, it was the very first strong cholesterol medicine. So everybody was on Zocor back in the beginning. The problem with simvastatin, it has a lot of medication, medication interactions. So say you're on 20 of simvastatin and the cholesterol is not good enough. And under ordinary circumstances, we wanna increase the dose to 40. Well, the FDA no longer recommends that you increase anybody's dose of simvastatin. So if you're on it and it's working and your cholesterol is good, leave it alone. But if there are any issues, it's probably better to not be on simvastatin as a general rule. And we never prescribe it anymore. Okay, another cholesterol question. Is it okay to have the cholesterol checked after fasting from a very light snack, only four hours, if done consistently? It turns out that um, it's really not the cholesterol at all that matters with the override fast. There's another fat in the blood called the triglycerides. So the triglycerides are what really warrants an overnight fast. So if you're doing this four hour small snack thing and your triglycerides are 120 anyway and your cholesterol is good, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, but if your, cholesterol, if your triglycerides are you know, 250 or 300 and there's some concern about your triglycerides, that's the time you definitely need to have a complete and utter overnight fast. Okay, how would you correct a leaky heart valve on an 80-year-old man with other problems? Well, that, that would depend. That's a great question, uh, but you really kind of got to get into the weeds of that. So I would say this, first of all, it depends on what heart valve problem that you're talking about. Typically speaking now for an aortic valve that does not open, aortic stenosis, a 80 year old guy is going to get a TAVR, that procedure that I showed you the picture of. For an 80 year old guy who has a leaky mitral valve, if they're otherwise in decent shape to have surgery, those people are typically gonna have surgery to fix the valve. We don't really like to replace the mitral valve nowadays. So there's something called mitral valve repair. Those would be the two uh, classics. So you know, those are the most common heart valve problems, an aortic valve that doesn't open and a mitral valve that doesn't close. There are other problems like mitral valves that don't open and aortic valves that don't close, but those are less common problems. Yeah, a couple questions on ablation. Um, so, what heart problems would require you to need ablation and are there different types of heart ablation? Uh, I mean, yes, the answer is there are different types of heart ablations. 
So the go back to that picture I showed you about the heart's electrical wiring. Okay, the most two most the most common thing that people hear about is atrial fibrillation ablation. All right, so you have this abnormal heart rhythm, it's called atrial fibrillation, the heart's beating irregularly. Um, and sometimes it makes you feel like your heart's beating funny or it's beating too fast and it's an uncomfortable feeling and you, and you wanna get that fixed. So it turns out that there are some structures, I didn't show you these structures, there are some structures in the upper chambers that are called the pulmonary veins. Those are the structures that bring the blood that has oxygen back into the left upper chamber to get pumped out to your body. And many times the trigger for atrial fibrillation is located inside the pulmonary veins. So you can go in there through your leg and uh, create some scar tissue around the pulmonary vein. The thing about scar tissue is it doesn't conduct electricity inside the heart. So if you scar up around the pulmonary vein and there are four of them, then the trigger for atrial fibrillation stays in the pulmonary vein, doesn't reach the heart, and it can cure you from uh, atrial fibrillation. Problem with that is it's only about 70% successful, 75% successful. In that case, typically at Valley, we use a, a, a device that delivers ice cold inside the heart to create that scar tissue. There are other ways to do it with like what, what amounts to a microwave probe. We call it radio frequency energy. Okay, so that's the most common ablation. There are other abnormal heart rhythms. You know, they have complicated doc names, but like AV node reentrant tachycardia or SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, a rapid heartbeat that's coming from the upper chamber, where people have an extra wire between the upper and the lower chamber that causes heart rhythm abnormalities. And so you can go in there again with a, a wire and look for where that extra wire is and burn it, okay? And then you don't have that wire anymore and the heart rhythm goes away. So I would say those are the two most common times types of ablation, one for atrial fibrillation, one for SVT. Okay, um, palpitations while urinating, is that a concern? Not necessarily. Palpitations are very common. Palpitations is just a doc word for I feel my heartbeat. You know, so basically, you know, 99 times out of 100, you don't feel your heartbeat. So um, the fact of having it when you urinate, you know, when you urinate, believe it or not, and when you defecate also, your pulse goes down because the same nerve endings that come from your brain that release the urine actually slow down the pulse. So there is an effect, and actually it's hugely common, believe it or not, for like a guy to pass out at night when they're urinating because they go from lying down to standing up to walking to peeing and set off these reflexes and they're lightheaded to start and down they go. So there is a connection. It's not like it's in your mind necessarily that urination could have no complication with palpitations, but also there's a certain amount of uh, uh, you know, nervous, not I mean nervous anxiety, I mean nervous impulses that might contribute to it. In general, if someone like that were to come to my office, I would give them a heart monitor to wear. It looks like the EKG wires, but it's attached to a little box, records every heartbeat. You go ahead and take a leak. And if you have palpitations, you push the button and then we can see what your heart's doing when you're having that feeling. Usually it's not gonna turn out to be like a life-threatening kind of problem. Okay, are heart flutters serious? Flutters is just another word for palpitations. There is a heart rhythm abnormality called flutter, atrial flutter, which is a brother and sister rhythm to fibrillation. But flutter is just the way patients describe the feeling in their chest when they're having palpitations. So the broader category is palpitations. And then some people say their heart goes skip and their heart goes boom and their heart goes flutter and their heart goes you know flippity flop, whatever it is. But it's just another word to describe uh, palpitations. In general, people tend to have fluttering and palpitations in bed at night when the lights are out and they haven't gone to sleep yet because you and your heart, you're alone together and no one's disturbing you. But if you're having an abnormal heart rhythm, you're just as likely to have it during the day as you are at night 
It's just that when you're talking to me and listening to a lecture on cardiology, you don't notice it because you're distracted. Um, but fluttering is the same like whatever, if, if you have associated symptoms, like you get fluttering and you're gonna pass out, or you get fluttering in your short of breath, or you get fluttering in your, you know, get all sweaty, whatever, that would be more concerning. And again, if it's bothering you, it's the same story. You know, there's such a thing as a heart monitor and we could look into it. Okay, this person had uh, the calcium cardio done at Valley last spring. It what, came what was your score? Uh, <laughs> it came back indicating some blockages. Um, no, no, it doesn't. It does not indicate blockages exactly. That's that's okay. not correct. It indicates atherosclerosis, and then you need further evaluation to see if you have blockages. Okay, so, so but let's talk about coronary calcium for a second. Okay, so. The idea of coronary calcification study is a normal calcium score is zero. You're not supposed to have any calcium in your arteries. So atherosclerosis, this kind of fatty blockages that need stents and bypass surgery, it's an, a little bit of an inflammatory illness. Like if you hit your thumb with a hammer and it's swollen and inflamed. And when the artery is inflamed on the inside, it gets these little micro deposits of calcium in the wall of the artery that aren't supposed to be there. It's actually very similar, uh, believe it or not, to breast cancer. So when a woman has a mammogram, the radiologist can't really see breast cancer. But breast cancer is an inflammatory illness and also gets microcalcifications. And it's those little clusters of calcifications that the radiologist can see on a mammogram. So what a um, coronary calcium score is telling you that you have the beginnings of atherosclerosis. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a blockage. You have some plaque perhaps, although not necessarily. So that needs to be looked into further. Calcium scores are logarithmic, which means that their score could be 10 or 100 or 1,000. So I have people who have coronary calcium scores of 36, and I have patients who have coronary calcium scores of 2,000, right? So the risks are different. The treatment for coronary calcium scores, uh, coronary calcium that's not zero, are the cholesterol medicines right? Because you had the beginnings of atherosclerosis, you want to slow that down. So you want to be on Crestor or Lipitor. Depending upon how high the coronary calcium score is and what your other risk factors are, you might consider aspirin, although not necessarily. And then third, you would want something like a stress test or some other additional test to make sure that you didn't have a significant blockage that needed to be dealt with now. Okay, so related to that uh, question, it, someone told them to stop taking calcium supplements as this well, can cause blockages. Okay. No, so, no, it, it turns out that's part of my speech. I missed it. It turns out that calcifications have nothing to do with vitamin D and calcium in your diet or any of those things. So it's not necessary to stop your treatment for osteoporosis because you have coronary calcifications. Okay. Is there. Um, a recommended time frame to wait or to have the calcium score redone? I don't, um, well, if the score is zero and you have risks, you know, like you're a diabetic and you're high blood pressure or your dad died young or some reason, right? I mean, I don't typically order coronary calcium scores as a general rule. Um, my personal take on coronary calcium scores is I only order them on people who I think should be on Lipitor and don't want to be on Lipitor. And I'm trying to convince them to go on the Lipitor. Coronary calcium scores can be helpful. But once you have a calcium score of 50, the treatment is no different if it goes up to 150 or 500 even, right? It's all going to be cholesterol medicines you know, or don't let me forget what I refer to as good, clean, healthy living, which is weight loss, exercise, eating right. That's important too. I tend to push drugs and forget about the holistic things. Weight loss, exercise, eating right. Um, but it, so I don't really recommend if, if you have a positive calorie calcium score, repeating it again is really not a helpful test. Just makes, oh. you, just makes you more nervous. <laughs> okay, so you might need to interpret this a little bit for me. What treatment options are available for SLE patients with excellent lipid profiles where the lupus has caused atherosclerotic plaque? Also, what treatment is available for SLE patients with SVTs besides wearing an ICM device? Okay. 
Okay, let's just briefly mention for the people who know, know uh, systemic lupus erythematosus is an autoimmune illness like rheumatoid arthritis, where your body's immune system has decided that instead of attacking bacteria and foreign invaders, it wants to attack you, right? So your own immune system is messing you up. So that, that's sort of what lupus is. And lupus can be associated, that's a sort of an unusual thing. Uh, not a, I mean, it's not unusual in lupus patients, but it's an unusual thing overall. Uh, it's an, also a total body inflammatory problem. And one of the things that get inflames, inflamed are the arteries. So you can get inflammation of the arteries that doctors would call vasculitis. That vasculature is what it sounds like and itis is inflamed. You can get vasculitis from lupus and get a problem in your arteries that has nothing to do really directly with atherosclerosis, right? So the treatment is really going to be the anti-inflammatory treatment and the rheumatologic, uh, the biologics, and that's kind of thing that you're going to take for lupus. However, if now you have documented atherosclerosis, right, a, a, a fatty appearing blockage by whatever test it is that you had that suggested that, you would still benefit from being on cholesterol medicines. All right. And then the second part of the question was, was a rhythm thing. Say it again, I'm sorry. Um, Something about the ICM. Yes. Also, what treatment is available for lupus patients with SVT? Gotcha. So SVT okay. is what I was talking about before. Um, I see, uh, uh, you're talking about a, a monitor. So if you have documented SVT, you should have an ablation. Right, ablation can often cure people who have SVTs, depending upon what it is. It's a little bit of a complicated subject to be discussing in this kind of a forum, but um, there's no reason why a lupus patient who ha has also developed an SVT, which really is an unrelated problem to the lupus, why that person shouldn't uh, get a, an ablation just like anybody else who had an SVT. And the uh, intracardiac monitor thing, you know, if you have it, you should just get it treated and be done with it. Okay, so I think I know the answer to this, but I will ask it. Um, when do you need to see a doctor for heart arrhythmia? Well, that's a good question. I would say there's two things that push people in my direction. One is if their quality of life is adversely affected because of the palpitations that they're having. So you get the palpitations and arrhythmia and you don't feel good, you know, come to see me. Or if you get the arrhythmia and you have what docs call associated symptoms, like I'm lightheaded, like I was saying before, lightheaded, sweaty, dizzy, chest pain, you know, whatever, nauseous. So if you have this sort of arrhythmia and you're having some other thing that might be caused by the arrhythmia, that would be a good reason to see a doctor. So either my quality of life is adversely affected because of my symptoms or I have associated symptoms. Okay, you mentioned aspirin before. Who should take an aspirin a day? So the treatment with aspirin changed just three or four years ago. So it used to be that anybody who came to my office and was kind of like a diabetic or dad died young or anybody, anybody who had like a risk, we put them on aspirin. But it turns out that aspirin is a risky medicine, even though it's been in your like, you know, cabinet for, you know, decades. For instance, much riskier than Lipitor or Crestor is in terms of bruising and bleeding and stomach ulcerations and those sorts of things. So aspirin is no longer recommended for primary prevention. Primary prevention means that you don't have a heart problem and you're afraid you're gonna get a heart problem. Aspirin is only recommended for people who have established problems. Like you've had a heart attack, you've had a stroke, you've had bypass surgery, you've had a stent, something has happened, then the risks of aspirin are worth it. If you haven't had anything happen, then you shouldn't take aspirin. Okay. Does someone need a referral to come see you or a cardiologist? That, that's an insurance question, right? So it okay. depends upon, you know, most people, particularly around here, don't have HMOs where they need to get the permission of their internist to go see a specialist. There are still plans like that, but most people around here don't have that. So as a general rule, the answer is no. You could just call up and make an appointment. Okay. Um, we do have a question that's a little bit 
um, specific, but um, okay. it's our last question. And uh, this is uh, someone who has proximal AFib, one to two episodes a year. Um, they take rate controlled drugs and blood thinners during the episodes and for 30 days afterwards. And they can tolerate the limited episodes and at age 63, otherwise in good health, at what point should one consider ablation? Well, I wanna back up and say that uh, taking the blood thinner intermittently after the episodes is not an effective strategy from my perspective. Either commit your, I mean, if you don't have any, that's complicated. There's this thing called, it's got a really funny doc name. It's called the Chad's VASC score. And it has to do with rating people who have atrial fibrillation to decide whether they should be on blood thinners. And it has to do with, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have heart disease? Do you have diabetes? How old are you? Have you previously had a stroke? This kind of thing. And there's like a score. And so if you're 63 years old and you're a man and you don't have any of the risk factors, you don't have high blood pressure, you don't have diabetes, you haven't had a stroke, you haven't had coronary disease, you don't need to be on a blood thinner period at all even if you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Now, when you get to be age 65, right, then it's sort of in a more gray zone. And by the time you're on 70, you should just be on uh, anticoagulation all the time. So that would be my uh, take on the anticoagulation part of the story that you brought up. In terms of ablation, it's not clear that ablation makes anybody live longer, right? So ablation is really having to do with how you feel. And so if you get it twice a year and it lasts for a day and you take your rate control medicines and you feel fine, you do not need to have an ablation. The natural history of atrial fibrillation is it's going to get worse, sorry to say. So it's going to become more frequent or more prolonged, or one day you're going to have an episode and that episode's not going to go away. And it is easier to ablate people early. In other words, the success rate of ablation is more successful early on compared to late. But again, it doesn't make you live any longer. So if you're tolerating the rhythm of the way you are and you're 63, I wouldn't do anything. Okay, and I think we have one last question because we have just a couple more minutes. Um, if a woman has a bladder hernia or prolapse, can that affect one's heart? I don't think so. Okay. You know, again, anybody who has like pain or difficulty urinating or frequent urination or, or any of those kind of bladder prolapsy kind of problems. Uh, they have some stress, their adrenaline levels are higher. So maybe in an indirect way, it could give you more palpitations or something like that. But there's, I would say there's no you know, clear direct relationship between uterine or bladder prolapse and a heart problem. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Barr. Um, this was you very guys are welcome. Um, My office is in Westwood. Yep, he's um, part of Valley Medical Group. Happy to answer any questions.